You know, that hymn fits in with the spirit of what we're going to deal with tonight. If you take your Bible, please, and open to the book of Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon and chapter who knows what? Six. Right you are. Chapter six. Song of Solomon, chapter six. Ah, we. After tonight, it's just two more chapters and the whole book is done. It's like life. It goes by so quickly, doesn't it? Yeah. I was talking with um, uh, a lady. My wife and I were visiting with uh, her and two other ladies this afternoon. And um, I, I mentioned that. I brought that up. That um, it used to be years and years and years ago when, when I was just a young buck that uh, it was only the, uh, the seniors that would say life goes by so quickly. But now it's everyone. Uh, and the youth are saying it. Young people are saying it too. And right away, uh, one of the, uh, the women, she was uh, um, advanced in years, she said her opinion was because people are too busy. Way too busy. Everyone is far, far too busy holding down two and three jobs. They're so busy, busy, busy that... Pfft, Time just goes by so quickly. That was her opinion. And I, I don't think she's half wrong either. I think that we are running around like crazy chickens or something like that. But um, before you know it, Song of Solomon will be over. Wow, what a great, uh, a great book. And we're learning from it. I'm making all my notes this time, and I'm trying to compose them together into some kind of little booklet. So these are all my notes here that I've had on the different chapters. So we're on chapter 6 tonight. And um, are we ready? Ta-da! Song of Solomon. The Song of Songs. Right? And we're looking at chapter 6. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this wonderful book. It's often misunderstood, but it has a place in Scripture, and it sort of finds itself right in the middle of the Bible, in a manner of speaking. And uh, maybe it's because it sort of expresses your heart toward us. Uh, you do love us. It's like a love letter put right in the middle. Uh, help us tonight, Heavenly Father, to learn how to love you back and love you more like we ought to, like we should uh, we're known as the bride of Christ. Help us to be a good bride, chaste and pure, and very much in love with our Savior. And so uh, guide us, Lord, verse by verse tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, um, if you will remember, the, uh, the bride seems to be in a dream from chapter 5. And so um, we have different conversation happening in chapter 5. In chapter 6 now, uh, we have the daughters of Jerusalem. If you look at it, please. Uh, Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Now, in uh, the previous chapter, um, the, um, the, the, the daughters of Jerusalem said in verse 9, What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? It's almost like uh, they were scorning her, making fun of her. But they don't seem to be doing that now. Now their, their, to their tune has changed. You say, what changed it? It was this fantastic description she gave of her beloved. And she goes through. She says, oh, and she said, verse 10, My beloved is white and ruddy and chiefest among men, and his head is this, and his locks, and his eyes, and his cheeks, and his lips, and his hands, and his belly, and his legs, and his countenance, and his mouth. And, uh, wow, that changed their tune. So now, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, the daughters are speaking. Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Uh, whither is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? You see, now they're very helpful. But uh, this expression, the daughters of Jerusalem, I found very interesting. I did a little study on it, and... Um, I discovered that the expression, the daughters of Jerusalem, is used only eight times in the entire Bible. Daughters of Jerusalem. And seven of those times are here in the book of Song of Solomon. 
And I want you to go with me to the New Testament. And I want you to see the last, the eighth and the last time the expression daughters of Jerusalem is used. If you turn, please, to the Gospel of Luke. Let's go there quickly. And then we're going to go right back to Song of Solomon. But Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. At this point in the gospel narrative, our Lord Jesus had been betrayed. He'd been uh, falsely accused. He'd been condemned. He'd been beaten. He'd been taken to Pilate. Um, his, the Roman soldiers had uh, uh, made up the crown of thorns and put it on him and mocked him and spit on him. And they pulled his beard and they whipped him. And he was a bloody, beaten mess. And it's absolutely... He was kind of, he didn't look human. He was beaten that badly, just mush. He was so badly beaten and bloodied all over. And now he's compelled to carry his cross, which he, he physically wasn't able to do. So they got another guy named Simon, Simon of Cyrene, and they compelled him to bear the cross. And then as Jesus was being uh, forced, pushed along the pathway, they call it the Via Della Rosa, the Way of Sorrows, um, out of uh, the city of Jerusalem, uh, outside where he would be crucified, uh, there's this group of women. And if you look, please, in uh, verse 27, and there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. And here is the final time the expression daughters of Jerusalem is used. Jesus turning unto them said, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. And I just want to make a suggestion here. Jesus was on his way to be crucified. And out of the blue, he uses an expression that's only ever found in the Song of Solomon, which, of course, the book, as we understand it now, expresses a tremendous love God has for his people. And it would be almost poetic, wouldn't it? Here Jesus loved his people so much that he was willing to go to the cross and die for them, for their sins. It's just interesting why he would choose that expression, daughters of Jerusalem. Isn't that something? And it was only found in the book of Song of Solomon, the only other, only other book it's found, but seven times in Song of Solomon. All right, well, let's turn back there. And now, uh, let's see. I guess we better do one of these. <clears throat> Here's our outline. The daughters of Jerusalem uh, speaking in verse 1. And now we have Israel. Or um, uh, in the narrative, remember, it's Solomon and his bride. And uh, the, the grander, bigger picture is God and his people. So up, up here on the screen, we're using God and Israel, God and his people. But here in the book, we're talking about Solomon and his bride. And so now at this point, uh, the bride speaks. And uh, in verses 2 to 3, uh, she, she here she talks about uh, a garden. My beloved has gone down into his garden. Now, she previously spoke of um, the garden uh, in terms of, um, in chapter 4 there, um, she previously spoke of this. Uh, it was metaphorical. It, it had to do with their physical uh, union together. Uh, their physical relations together. However, here, it appears to be more of an actual garden. Uh, although, bear in mind, this is still part of the dream. The dream's not over yet. Remember, the dream started back there in chapter 5, and it continues on. This is still part of, part of the dream. Um, if you just turn back a couple of pages to Ecclesiastes, go to chapter 2, if you wouldn't mind. Interesting verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, written, of course, by Solomon. And if you look, please, at verses 5 and 6, you'll see something that Solomon wrote. Uh, he said, I made me gardens and or orchid orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water there with the wood that bringeth forth trees. And so uh, the garden he made was, was not some little 10 foot by 10 foot place to plant peas and cabbages. Th this was a fantastic uh, garden. Uh, Solomon, it seemed that 
Uh, everything he did, he wanted to do in a big way, a grandiose way. If you've ever read through Ecclesiastes, you know that he, he did all kinds of things. Uh, he had the power, the physical power and the money to do it. And he did things, wow, that, you know, bigger than Bill Gates, right? That kind of thing. That's uh, Solomon. That's what he would do. So here in this chapter, in these verses in Ecclesiastes, uh, for sure, for sure, Solomon had some elaborate, fantastic gardens. Okay? That's all we're pointing out. Because go back to Song of Solomon. Here, his bride, in her dream, says that uh, he's in the garden. Now, if you'll remember in chapter 5, he disappeared on her. And he couldn't find her. Do you remember that? And she got pretty worried about that. And in her dream, she's running around the streets uh, looking for him. And the watchman uh, assaults her. Do you remember that? And, uh, you know, they grab her veil off her. And she must be frightened. Well, now here in the chapter, chapter 6, she suddenly comes out with this. And she says that, um, oh, well, he's, he's in his garden. Well, if she knew he was in his garden, then why did she run up and down all the streets of Jerusalem looking for him? And the answer is very simple. It's a dream. And a dream can, you know, turn on a dime. Maybe you remember some dream you had where you were walking into your house, and when you got into the house, all of a sudden you were someplace else. You know, dreams have a habit of sort of turning the table on you. And so, for reasons we'll never know, in her dream, she just all of a sudden knew where he was. He was in his garden, of course. And so, it's a dream, remember. Dreams mutate. She just knew. Well, she also seemed to know that she had not lost him. Because she was afraid she'd lost him. Now, she seemed to know where he was and that she had not lost him. And that they belonged together. And that, uh, she, and that they would be together soon. So let's look at it. Verse 2 and 3. He's down in, the, in his garden to the beds of spices to feed in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. See that? There's confidence there. I am his, he is mine. So there's confidence. She knew where he was. She also knew that they would be together again. And look at that. He seems to be gathering lilies. I wonder if she knew maybe that those lilies were going to be for her. Maybe. Down there gathering the flowers. Well, now we move along in the narrative. And now we have uh, Solomon's portion. And we put in brackets there to be continued. So, beginning in verse 4, now the narrative changes over to Solomon. Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Tirzah, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners. Now, in verse 4, it seems that they're back together again. He is showing up, and they're back together again. And he, he calls her uh, beautiful. Um, he says, uh, O my love, as Tirza, <clears throat> thou art beautiful, O oh my love, as Tirza. What in the world is Tirza? The word Tirza means uh, beauty. It means pleasure. According to Numbers chapter 26, verse 33, Tirza was a man's daughter. And later there was a city built and named after her. And so we know what Jerusalem is. And uh, Jerusalem would have been very, very beautiful in Solomon's time. He would have made sure of it. But then he says, terrible as an army with banners. Now, we use that word terrible in kind of a negative sense. But um, the, the word picture here is something awesome, something overpowering. Back in uh, those days and other days as well, when an army got itself ready for battle and it would present itself on the battlefield, it would present itself in an overpowering. They wanted to uh, give shock and awe to the enemy. And they had banners and colors and their swords were polished and they would uh, purposely uh, try and reflect the light off them and, you know, into the enemy's eyes and the gleaming and the trumpets and all that stuff. But the banners, um, the, the sight of that, uh, if, if there were any weaklings in the other army, they would turn and flee. 
And so the word picture is this awesome, uh, almost overpowering presence. And look, at that's what he, he used, that's how he described his wife. That's very interesting that he would say that. Um, as terrible as an army with banners. And so uh, he, he gets here into verse 5 and he says, Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. Wow, he's, uh, this is different. It's, it's very strong speech stronger than what he's used uh, before. She overcame him just by looking at him. And it's almost as if Solomon was saying to her, um, um, uh, look away. I'm, I, I'm so excited by the, your beauty, the beauty of your eyes. I can't take it. It's almost like he's saying that. Now you don't hear people talk like that too often. Uh, he was overcome by his wife. Charles Spurgeon related this to Jesus and the church. And he said that Jesus is overcome with love when he looks upon his church. Now, sometimes we, uh, we, would, we would respond like, oh, yeah, sure, right. And we don't realize what we look like in the Lord's eyes. Uh, sometimes when, um, uh, you know, to um, maybe younger people uh, sort of fall in love and they, they think each other is just the living end. Wow, you're so beautiful. You're so handsome and rugged. And yet to him, he doesn't think he's handsome and rugged. He looks at himself and he sees, you know, oh, I, could look, I, I need to lose a few pounds here. I need to tone up this. I need to do that. But she looks at him and she thinks, boy, he's Superman. He looks at her and she, he thinks that she's the most gorgeous thing he's ever seen in, in his life. And yet, you know, when she looks at herself in the mirror, all she sees are the, the defects. Likewise, when, you know, we look at ourselves, we say, oh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, the best we can do with what we've got. But when the Lord looks upon his bride, he's filled with love. Now, Jesus has no defect. He has no problems. When we look upon him, all we see is beauty and honor and glory and power and wisdom and wonder. Because that's what he is. But the unbelievable thing is when he looks upon us, that he sees us as, as something that we don't see ourselves as. Isn't that interesting? Interesting thought, isn't it? And so anyhow, here in the narrative... Um, it seems that Solomon was just overcome with love when he looked upon his bride. Now Solomon wrote elsewhere about being overcome uh, by the wrong woman. In Proverbs 6.25, he said, Lust not after her beauty in thine heart. And he's talking about the wrong kind of woman, okay? You know, just the wrong woman who goes the wrong way in life and who's headed the wrong place after death. So he says, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. And so it's important, it's also proper for a man to be overcome by the right woman. You say, well, who's the right woman? God's choice for him is the right woman. Whoever God's choice is, is the right woman. And it's proper then for him to be overcome. Now, unfortunately for Solomon, he didn't even listen to his own advice. He should have read his own scriptures. Uh, because, you know, it, it ended up destroying him. But look now back here at verse 5. And look what Solomon says after he's back together here with, uh, with his wife. And he starts complimenting her. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. It has kind of a real nice, homey, you can almost smell the, uh, the country air, you know, off words like that. It's really kind of nice here. But... Um, he, uh, he starts in about her hair, and then he goes on to compliment her teeth and her temples. You see here in verse 6, Thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not a barren one among them. You know, my wife and I have been together for, uh, we, we met 42, 42 years ago. We met 42 years ago, and I've given her lots of compliments, but I've never given her this one. I've never said to her that her teeth are like a flock of sheep. I've never done that. 
And it's not because uh, I don't think I'm uncaring or in, uncompassionate or unloving. It's just that's not how we talk. We talk a little different these days, don't we? And so uh, I tend to think that uh, the lovers back in Solomon's day had more of a poetic nature to them. By the way, the Hebrew language itself is one of the best languages in the world for poetry and for word pictures and meanings and so on. Um, in studying Hebrew for a number of years, I've learned that a Hebrew word uh, can often have as many as 10 different meanings to it. And so you kind of have to know the context and how the words are used and the heartbeat of it to kind of find your way through. Uh, Hebrew people have no problem doing that, you know, but us gringos, you know, we, you know, we clunk our way along in that and we're very dependent upon experts. But um, isn't that interesting? He compliments her teeth. And then verse seven, as a piece of pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. Isn't that something? Brother Ariel, have you ever told your wife that her temples are like pieces of pomegranate? No? I've never told my wife that either. No. I don't know of any man who's, aside from Solomon here, who's actually said that. I don't know. We might compliment their hair, their eyes. We might compliment their beautiful dress or their hands or maybe a, a, their figure or something like that. We might make compliments like that. But uh, I don't know anyone who compliments a woman's temples or, or talks about her teeth like that. Maybe a dentist might. I don't know. Um, but that, that would be about it. But look at that. Now, this is reminiscent, right? Because back two chapters ago, chapter four, you remember he started lavishing all these compliments on her. You remember that? Yes? Just pretend you, you agree with me. Yeah, I feel better that way. And so in chapter 4, he was lavishing all these compliments on her. But the context of those compliments was their wedding night. That was their time together. And in fact, he gave her eight compliments. And many of them to do with her, her physical beauty and kind of the, you know, the romantic physical side. But here, he gives her three compliments. And he doesn't get into that same kind of wedding night romanticism that, that he did back in chapter 4. You say, why is that? It's because it seems to be a reconciliation. Now, one commentator that I checked with uh, on this passage said something interesting that um, I'll sort of paraphrase what the commentator said, but when, when uh, a husband and wife get estranged a little bit and they come back together... Um, she's going to want to know that he loves her for more than her body. And so that may be why Solomon uh, only gave her these compliments and not some other very intimate compliments so that she, she knows that he loves her for who she is. So I thought that was an interesting thought on that. Sometimes the commentators come out with some good things. I, I sort of thought that was interesting. But um, uh, let's move on here. Uh, we, we come now to verse uh, 8. And uh, Solomon now describes his bride as compared to other women. He says, There are threescore queens and fourscore concubines and virgins without number. Now, a lot of commentators think that uh, Solomon had a whole bunch of wives at this point. Now, we know that Solomon is well known for all of his wives and concubines. And you add them all up, and how many did he have all together, approximately? A thousand, right? Can you imagine that? <clears throat> one, one fella that uh, did a little thing on this, he says, wow, a thousand mother-in-laws. Imagine that, it's a dumb joke. Okay, anyhow, Solomon, he was well known for all of his, um, uh, his wives. But here he only mentions... But well, look at it again. Three score. How many is that? Six. Sixty. Right. That's sixty queens and four score concubines. How much is that? Eighty. 80. So sixty and eighty is a far cry from a thousand, isn't it? And so some commentators think that uh, the uh, the bride here came along, uh, you know, after Solomon was really starting to get into uh, his collecting of wives and concubines, like a collection and 
and this would have just been one more notch on his, you know, his gun barrel or something like that. Just one more amongst many. But um, there are other commentators that don't believe that, and I'm, I, I tend to, uh, to side with them. I think that um, it, it, that's not the case here at all. Um, you know, it's very important for a wife to feel that her husband values her more than any other woman. That's very important. If a, if a wife doubts that or is afraid that her husband, you know, uh, thinks that the girl at the office and the lady down the street, you know, are of, of equal uh, uh, value as she is, well, that's going to destroy the marriage, isn't it? They're not going to have a communion, a closeness together. How can they? How can they have intimacy? Uh, the wife needs to know that the husband values her more than any other woman in the world. There's so many, many fine women out there all around the world, no question. But for this one husband, that one wife beats them all. And that's how, that's how uh, she has to see it. Um, the, uh, the thousand wives and concubines actually destroyed Solomon's life. Destroyed his heart. Destroyed his life. Really bad. Um, but... Here, the language, he says, there are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. Um, my dove, my undefiled is but one. She is the only of her mother. It's like he's comparing her and it's like he's saying she's better than the rest. That's what it seems like. Um, that um, he feels that um, uh, she's better than the rest. Um, now, this business about having many wives, uh, we need to make a comment here. Um, it was common in Solomon's day for many kings to have many wives and concubines, and it was often called a harem. A harem, maybe, is what they would say. Uh, Solomon's father, David, he had one. He had several wives. Um, that's very true. Uh, these harems were made up of daughters from neighborhood kings. See, this is what they did to ensure peace and to protect themselves, that uh, the king would marry the daughter of that king over there, and uh, she'd be his wife. And that would help ensure that that king would never attack this kingdom. And maybe that king would marry this king's daughter, which would ensure that this king would never attack that king. And so it was more political. Uh, what the daughters looked like or whether the kings had any desire for them is beside the point. But this is what they would do. And of course, then children would come along and no one wants to attack a kingdom and destroy it when their own grandchildren are over there, right? And so this was how they did it back then. Um, but Solomon's language throughout Song of Solomon does not seem to sound like his bride is just one of many. It doesn't seem like that at all. At least to my ears, it doesn't. In fact, uh, the opposite. It sounds like um, uh, this is his very first bride. Now, if that's true, then how do we account for this verse here? Verse 8, there are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. Well, I just want to make a suggestion. Personally, I think that Solomon, this was his very first wife. This is her. And he was really head over heels in love with her. And I think that what he was saying was like metaphorically. He was saying, uh, imagine, using imagination, that there, there's harems out there. And I know that there's all of these other queens and concubines and so on, none of which he has. But if he ever did, she outranks them all. Now, that may not sound like the best compliment today, but given the context that that kind of thing was common in kingdoms in order to, to you know, protect the kingdom and keep everyone you know, at peace, I think that what he was saying is that if such a thing ever happened, you'd always be my number one. I think that's what he's getting at when he says that. Now well, we can ask him when we get to heaven, I suppose. Um, verse 9. Apparently, he says here, 
my un undefiled is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice of her that bear her. Uh, the daughter saw her and uh, blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, there they are again. And they praised her. So uh, he says that she is the one and only of her mother. Now, we don't have time to go to chapter 8. But if we went to chapter 8, we'd find out that this bride had brothers. She has brothers. And we're going to learn about them in a couple of weeks' time. But there's no mention here of a sister. Doesn't appear to be, anyhow. And therefore, the daughters, the queens, and the concubines may be just as theoretical uh, and not actual as in the previous verse. Then we get to verse 10. And uh, he says, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as an army with banners? There's the army again. And in verse 10, essentially, he's assuring her of his love and showing that there's no anger or lingering problem. There's no withheld forgiveness. Because remember, back in chapter 5, it was her fault. He came to the door and said, let me in, and she wouldn't. She said, oh, no, I've washed my feet, I'm in bed, you know, and all that kind of thing. And then finally, at the sound of the rattling of the lock, that's when she thought, oh, okay, and she got up and she went and he was gone. You remember that in chapter 5? Only a week ago. And so uh, it was her fault, and he comes back to her. And there's, there's no uh, sign here of anger or lingering bitterness or problems, uh, no withheld forgiveness. And again, very, very important. In uh, marital relationships, that happens a lot, where there's a spat and then there's a lingering, a lingering that goes on. And Often the lingering is like a, a bitterness. And sometimes, listen, what happens is after a, a day, two days, three days of not speaking to each other, the, uh, uh, the couple have, may have forgotten what it was that you know, caused the boom. They've forgotten what it was, but the emotion is still there. So the actual fact of what caused the problem, they can't remember. What was, how do we get into an argument anyhow? Do you, I don't even remember. But yet the emotion is still there. In this case, he comes and he gives her such assurance that there's no lingering bitterness. There's no anger. There's no unresolved conflict. There's no withheld forgiveness. Isn't that good? Yes? No? Yes. Yes. That's good marital stuff right there. Meat and potatoes for us. Boy, I tell you, you know, it's speaking to my heart. In verse um, uh, 11, uh, here Solomon now talks about uh, when he went to the garden because she said earlier in the chapter, you know, that she found him. My beloved has gone down into his garden in verse 2. So verse 11 now, Solomon is speaking. He says, I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranates budded. And uh, so Solomon talks about his visit down to this garden. And he uh, recounts that uh, when he was out of her sight, uh, he had gone down to the garden. It appears to be springtime and things were budding. But verse 12, while he was in the garden, watch this. Or ever I was aware, my soul made me like the chariots of Aminadab. And so in verse 12, while he was in the garden, this irresistible inclination to return to his bride came over him. And he talks about the chariots of Aminadib. Now, commentators are divided as to who in the world or what in the world Solomon meant when he said Aminadib. Because um, there's next to nothing on it in the scriptures, the chariots of Aminadib. Now, the Hebrew word translated Aminadib is a compound word, and it may have meant uh, a willing people or even a willing princess. But whatever it means, the context of the verse, the context in which it's given tells us, it's evident that it meant fast flight back into the arms of his wife. That's what he's talking about. Whether we understand what Aminadib is all about, just the fact that he says, 
my soul made me like the, the chariots of the minuted. This overpowering desire just to run back and to, to be with her. There is a guy in the Old Testament named Jehu. And um, they recognized him by the way he drove his chariot. You remember that, reading that? He was coming toward a city and he was far off and, you know, he was in the chariot. And uh, they're saying, hey, who is that? Who is that coming? And, and one of them said, well, it's, he drives like Jehu, the way he was driving. I remember hearing a guy saying that uh, Jehu's got a lot of relatives over here in the, this country. <laughs> the, way that, uh, the way he drove his chariot. Boy, we saw one of them uh, yesterday, uh, my wife and I. Whoosh. Uh, anyhow, uh, he would really wanted to get back into her arms. And so we get to verse 13. And um, return, return, O Shulamite. This chapter here closes with Solomon's heart crying out for her. I think it's very evident that he was really head over heels in love with this girl. I think that it was the first girl he ever proposed to, his first wife. And I think at the time, as far as he was concerned, she would be the only girl for him. She had kept herself pure, and they had a great glorious coming together. It was like a, a storybook um, kind of thing. Uh, Harry and uh, Meghan Merkel got married just recently, about a year ago, remember that? And the whole world was watching on TV, right? And if you saw that, there were crowds of, I don't know, 50, 100,000 or something insane, all these people all over the place there in this big long procession of the princess coming in, you know, in her gown and everything. I remember back in 81, that's when Charles and Diana were married because they got married just a couple more months before we did, Miss White and I. And so the world looked at their wedding, not at our wedding. They looked at Charles and Diana's wedding and that was a real storybook kind of thing. And the whole world fell in love with Diana. And she was just the toast of the town. The paparazzi couldn't get enough of her. And uh, the, she couldn't do anything wrong. It was just, just amazing. She could have asked for the world and the world would have just laid at her feet. A real storybook princess, you know, Cinderella kind of uh, uh, wedding there. Well, I think that Solomon uh, really, really loved this, this girl here. Now, I think he wanted her with all his heart. And this is the only time in the whole book she's ever called a Shulamite. We know that she's a Shulamite. How? From this one verse right here. Now, a Shulamite means someone from the Galilean town of Shunem. Galilee was an area, it was a rather poor area, uh, uneducated area. They were the salt of the earth kind of people, farmers and that sort of thing, fishermen. And uh, that's where it seems that she hails from, is from Shunan, a town in Galilee. Now, but watch this here. This is interesting because we have something weird that happens in verse 13. He says, return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look upon thee. Now watch what comes next. What will ye see in the Shulamite? Where'd that come from? That, that doesn't seem to belong. It doesn't seem to fit. I'd like to suggest that it's if some devil of doubt rears its ugly head and says, well, what do you expect to see in her? Some Shunammite, some poor little wench out of, out of a nothing town in a nowhere place. You know, she's nothing. That's almost what it seems like. Just like, I don't know, maybe the devil tried to get a shot in there at Solomon tried to discourage him, perhaps. But um, Solomon fires back and uh, says that her value to him is as if she were two large armies put together. And he finishes by saying, as it were the company of two armies. And we put the words up here, to be continued, dot, 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 because that's, that's what takes us into chapter 7 next week. Now, a conclusion for tonight's study. Did you know that Jesus, your Lord Jesus, loves you and his heart cries to be with you? Did you know that? If you didn't know that, you need to know that because that is the truth. 
that is the truth. You come from a sin-cursed world, worse than Galilee, worse than Shunan in Galilee, a sin-cursed world, and the truth is, what good are you to him? And yet your Savior believes that you're more valuable to him than all the world put together. That's what he thinks of you. One day he will hasten with the chariots of Amenadib and catch you away. That is the truth. Rhea F. Miller was the only daughter of Pastor Martin and Bertha Ross from Brooktondale, New York. Martin had been a godless drunk who got saved and gave up alcohol and entered the ministry. He became the pastor of the Baptist Church in Brooktondale, New York. The Miller family attended the Brooktondale Baptist Church and their son Howard soon married the pastor's daughter, Rhea. In 1922, Rhea began to reflect on her father's testimony of how he had been delivered from alcohol and how he, he said that he would rather have Jesus than all of the gold and silver in the world and all of the houses and all the land and all the money that all the money could buy. And this inspired her to write a poem. And she called it, I'd Rather Have Jesus. A few years later, in 1939, a singer by the name of George Beverly Shea found a copy of the poem and wrote the music for it. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. He's fairer than lilies of rarest bloom. He's sweeter than honey from out the comb. He's all that my hungering spirit needs. I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be a king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Christian, how much are you in love with your blessed Savior, Jesus Christ? Is it true that you'd rather have him than anything this world affords today? Because that's exactly how he feels about you. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the lover of our souls. And that you love us more than we love ourselves. And that your heart cries to be with us. And we find that so hard to understand, so hard to believe, and yet it's absolutely true. And you can hardly wait to the day when you'll come in the clouds and call us to yourself, catching us away. Lord Jesus, help us to love you. Help us to realize how much you love us. And you wrote in the Bible that we love him because he first loved us. So bless us, help us to grow in faith and love, in Jesus' name, amen.